Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews of items, and convention panels, and other exciting things that we run into from time to time. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. All righty. It's two win off. Uh, I guess we'll just start it. Two and a little bit. Two, so two and change. Um, yeah. Thanks all for for coming. Welcome. Do you want to? Yeah. You don't have a. Is anyone like Jenny's the much being moderator? You must. You must. You must. Yeah. You 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 have volunteered yourself. That's what I get. I've actually done like. Yes. The person who asks about the moderator gets the moderator. Yes. I like that. Well, welcome to the heroine's journey as opposed to Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, and I will have everybody introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Jill Knowles. I write um, fantasy, horror, and erotic romance, Um, and I really like to write strong, kick-ass, non-traditional heroines. Cool. I'm Carolyn Kay. I write primarily steampunk fantasy, but I also dabble in sci-fi, horror, and humor. Um, I also write strong female characters almost exclusively. Most of my protagonists are or women. My name is Donnie Wright. Um, I am a science communicator, science consultant. I work on the production side of things, so literature editing, um, the television production, um, and looking at the craft of stories in that sense. I'm Jenny Lee Simner. I write primarily dark fantasy, although I've written other things too. And my own stories actually tend to be, I tend to be fairly fond of Campbell's Hero's Journey, but I also know that it has its limitations. <clears throat> so that could maybe be even the first question yeah. is, what is all of your takes on the hero? If you even know, or I don't know if everyone is familiar Are with Campbell's. Familiar with Campbell's hero's journey structure, roughly, it's it's reasonable. I can actually I did print it out. I can go over what the what Campbell oh, says the structure. Yeah. Well, yeah, you do a real yeah. quick yeah, see if I can. For my sake, nothing else. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not going to read Refresh your course. <laughs> yeah, because I sit here on this panel. So he suggested that all heroic journeys, all you know, story journeys, had some things in common. And Joseph Campbell. And he suggested that journeys began with the call to adventure, which in Star Wars is a good example of a movie modeled on this. So, you know, the call to adventure is, you know, you need to come with me, you know, this droid shows up and, you know, wants to lead Luke on an adventure, but of course Luke resists the call, as characters often do, and then eventually gets pulled into the adventure. And then you have some sort of supernatural aid shows up to help you in this model, and that also you know, happens right as the sand people are about to destroy Luke. Then Kenobi shows up out of the sands. <coughs> and then you have allies and helpers who help you along the way. Oh, this actually you grab some. So then you go through several tests and there's a point in the story where you're in the belly of the whale, you know, kind of the hopeless low point, and then you, know, you go through several tests and Oh, I know why I'm missing things. Oh, this is too so. Okay. Okay, so there's the call to the quest. There's refusing the quest, which not everyone does, but a lot do. Actually, Wikipedia likes, I'm not Wikipedia, um, TV Tropes likes to talk about the quest knows where you live. <laughs> <laughs> which is when, say, in Star Wars, you know, Luke's family gets destroyed, and then, you know, what else is he going to do? 
But then once the adventure is accepted, the heroes enter into the unknown, and then they have supernatural aid shows up as they're struggling in this unknown world. And sometimes even a talisman or a magical item. So, you know, this is your father's lightsaber. Then allies and helpers come along the way. I suppose Han Solo would reluctantly fall into that. The droids. The, the droids. droids. Yeah, the droids. Yeah. And Leia, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in the first Unless one. it's her journey, but that could be a whole other session. Then you have tests and a final ordeal at the end. And then you go home, and kind of the part that's most interesting to me is somehow you need to bring what you've learned back home with you and transform home, which is, you know, the classic example actually is Lord of the Rings when Sam and Frodo go home, and it could be argued that Frodo doesn't finish his hero's journey because he can't reintegrate into our world or bring anything he's learned and taken from his adventure back with him and he leaves but Sam is the one who's able to stay and reintegrate. She does be fit the argument that Sam is the real protagonist. Yes, <laughs> which actually I think those <laughs> are the rings. I would not argue no. that. Yes. And those are the basics. There are guardians at thresholds sometimes. I don't know if I'm giving that in a coherent way, but basically it's an adventure to the unknown and a return. And so that's one of those things where I, I can't remember when he wrote um, The Hero's Journey. It's it's kind of made its way into the canon of how we look at stories. and. It's, there's something of a chicken or egg question of do we now write stories like this because we were presented with this format and we attempt to re retrofit stories into this box. Um, but I, guess, I suppose the question today is what about the ladies? And I did find that somebody, you know, there are a bunch of people who have suggested that female arcs might be different at least some of the time. And the first one to suggest this to Campbell was someone named Maureen Murdoch. And apparently she said, you know, this journey might be different for women. And Campbell said, women don't need a hero's journey. That's what everyone's trying to get to. Is there the hero's reward? That's the best object. You know, he wow. didn't say it that way, but. Well, yeah. yeah, but he's implying that they're the hero's reward. Yes. You come back exactly. home to the ladies. Yes, exactly. Well, there we go. There's our answer. I suppose we can all pack up. Yeah, yeah thanks, guys. Go home. Great pal. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Partially because of that, um, when you write heroines, especially if you're writing traditional high fantasy quest heroines, one of the ma their main struggles is to get the men to take them seriously, and it's really frustrating. And I'm always I was talking with Jenny earlier. Um, there's a, a young adult author named Tamara Pierce. Mm -hmm. The wonderful series, the Becca Cooper series where the main character is essentially a, a police officer. Yes. And it goes for her, you know, as she rises through the ranks and becomes better at investigation. So, and everybody just assumes that women can do anything men can do. And it's so refreshing to read that. I hadn't realized how omnipresent, you know, the, the women must fight for recognition was until I read books like that. And it's like, oh. So, it's just yeah, a given. Yeah, I, I like that it's starting to change. It's interesting when I go back and read Dragon Song, which is one of my favorite childhood books. It's by Anne McCaffrey. By Anne McCaffrey. It's a dragon writer's book basically for, for teens and kids. But so much time is spent on the fact that, you know, you're a woman, you can't do this. You're a woman, you can't do this. And it's not that those barriers don't still exist, but we're not quite as in your face about them. I mean, in that book, Peteron doesn't even recognize her because no one told him that the brilliant Harper was a girl. It, it's a question of, of, of time and place because there's a time and a place for stories where you get to watch somebody have similar struggles as yeah. you, where everyone says you can't, you're a girl, you can't do it. But there's also a time and place for stories where, because girl isn't the only part of an identity, woman right. isn't the only part of an identity. It's it's nice to read stories where you can see yourself, but it's not about that. 
Right. It's about, um, and, it, and there's similar issues, you know, although that's not what this panel's about, similar issues in, you know, minority communities and queer communities where you read a book about a gay person and it's a book about how they're a gay person. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, but what about a book where it's a fact, but it's not the story? And so the question with a heroine's journey is, you know, what is the journey and how is the story? And then I think the tricky part is not ignoring that identity. Right. <coughs> right. Which I know with, you know, multiracial books has been an issue where you just say, okay, I'll give someone different skin, but I'll make them basically a white right. person. Or I'll make, I'm always ambivalent about the, you know, well, this female character is really just a man with a female name. Mm -hmm. Hermione is an interesting example of that for me because she presents a very particular female character with her own particular journey and story arc. But there also comes to be the question where J.K. Rowling comes back and says, oh, and she's black. And there's no indication of that ever given in the story. So are we supposed to take that as a good thing that we didn't need to care about that or as a... You know, we could have given us a little bit. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, it, was it actually said that she was black she or was yes. it? Oh, she okay. she said it. Never in the book. Never in the book. She could. Be. Yeah. She, could. She, yeah. she, says, she says that there's never anything to say that she isn't. Um, and in later interviews came out and said, wasn't yes. That, wasn't that when they cast a black actress in a stage play mm -hmm. or something? Right. And that's when she said something about, well, she could be. Right. And yeah. I think that's a fine line to draw of saying we can open up to this kind of thing. It's another thing with saying, if you are in your some small part of your mind as a writer conceiving of a character this way, what is your responsibility as the writer to take that step? Well, you know, the other interesting thing, I was thinking about Hermione Granger the other day. Um, I tried to reread the Harry, Harry Potter books, and the, the adults make such stupid decisions. And I was like, <laughs> yes. I read them. I mean, so uh, I love the them. real world. Yeah. But if you look at Hermione, so she's there, but Every time the big showdown happens, she gets taken out before it happens. Yeah. And so she's she's the brains of the outfit, but you know she gets she gets uh, petrified by the basilisk in the second one um, because she figured it out before anybody else did, and you know so they couldn't do it. But there's so many of the times where you know the big showdown happens and her character is just shoved to the side. She's side -lined. And she's the one, she does Harry's homework at one point, <laughs> like literally. So what like, would, why isn't it her story? What would Harry Potter have looked like if it wasn't Harry Potter in the, you know, Sorcerer's Stone, but it was Hermione Granger in the Philosopher's Stone? Yeah. What does that story look like? She'd have been a Slytherin. <clears throat> no, I think she's a Raven's Claw. <laughs> yeah, she's probably, yeah, she's probably Raven's Claw. <laughs> would she have still made the same decisions? Would those decisions have had the same impact? And she would have done more research. She would have, like, before yeah. jumping in, she would have done well, the legwork. And the which... chances she takes are insane. And, and nobody, you know, she set Snape on fire. <laughs> she got a ton of travel device. Right? Yeah. Yeah. She's, to she's, take more classes. Those, those would be better stories in my mind. I think she'd have more plot armor. She wouldn't be taken out just the very last second. Right. She wouldn't be sidelined so that she's kept safe, essentially. And yet Harry is a classic hero's journey, mm -hmm. chosen one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so it would I it would be interesting to see how that would change. You know, what what would you have to change in Hermione's backstory to give her that chosen one aspect? Does so, she need the chosen one aspect? Well that's the that's other true. Is it yeah. one? Why is it not three anyway? Three right. Why isn't it yeah, why isn't it the, the chosen triad? And why that does anybody like Ron Weasley? Later, <laughs> I just want to punch him. He said that. It's not just about you, Mary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's not all. He's R2D2. Chosen one stories, it's actually not <laughs> just Stevens, Hermione. There's so many stories where you have a competent woman and a guy comes along and he has a dream. And the woman winds up supporting him in his dream, even though she's already better. At the thing being done. Ratatouille. The, I don't know if anyone oh, remembers yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Oh god. I was like, why? <laughs> why are it's like the dream of an unqualified character so much more important than someone who does some the does, work? Right. Yeah. And that actually happens in someone was saying in the sciences. Women get put oh, down yeah. because oh. you're just working yeah. hard. You're not gifted. I have stories. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah. I think a remarkable turn.
term is emotional labor that came out yes. several years ago, and I think that is behind so much of it. Emotional labor and, and the, the power of genius. You have to work at this. You have to put effort into this. It doesn't come naturally to you. So it's nice that you did it, but we have this magical, you know, these geniuses over here who accidentally dropped something into a vat and miraculously made a thing. They don't know how, they don't know why, but they're geniuses. And they're the true right. And they have geniuses. What's been crazy? Um, and we put value on that sort of, I am the lone face standing at the front and I did this thing because I am awesome. But what about people actually the work? I just want to make the comment that it was a young woman who brought us the images of the black hole. Yes. 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 And look yes. at all the backlash yes. that happened. Oh, so yeah. Backlash. Backlash. We're like, oh, you couldn't possibly have done it. And it's like, why, why not? The backlash from two sides being, if you couldn't possibly have done it, what about all the other people who helped you? And also the same backlash of, oh, these images are so doctored, and you know, how could you, how could you think that these are real images of a black hole? It's not good enough. You just moved the bar. Right. It's like, oh, you it? hit the bar. Oh no. Yeah. 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 To, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Stories. So many. So we're all saying these. Even mentioned. So we're saying these journeys reflect what goes on in real life. Right? <laughs> So uh, I wrote a book called Wings of the Wasp. My mom was a pilot in World War II. Mm -hmm. And it's a novel. And there's a lot of documentary stuff on it. But the thing that I learned in doing the research and all of that is what she had to go through and the fact that World War II was a turning point in culture for the United States. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, women were starting and minorities were becoming equal in the jobs they could do and the tasks they could do and that was the beginning of the downfall of the supreme man still with us still here but we're doing a lot better um, I was going to say you know what uh, the movie not the series Buffy the Vampire Slayer, when that came out, I was like, that was the first time I had seen in my, at that point, it was probably a good 40 years, where the, the female character actually got to rescue the guy, right? Mm -hmm. That was so exciting for me. But now I kind of feel like, you may have touched on this earlier, it's almost like all the female characters are this kick-ass kind of character using strength, which is not necessarily our biggest strength, you know, right. muscle power in general and so i'm just i mean weapons and strength i'm just like wondering is it just too much like they're putting a woman in a man's place mm -hmm. well, what does so, that mean right if, is, in, yeah. in a society that values particular things if you are going to be the hero you have particular traits and we expect those we say okay we're going to make women the heroes so we're going to give them these particular traits and these particular traits have been masculinized in our society so in order to make them heroes they're going to be acting in ways that we consider proto-masculine um, and then the question is how do we how do we take that do we accept that do we look for better do our should we just be grateful they're on the screen one of the things do that though that undermining buffy. yeah how do um, we do that with go ahead. I just, uh one of the things about buffy though is that she did most of that in high heels mm -hmm. you know yeah. she she cared about her hair she you know she was no i like had buffy. typical feminine yeah attributes and she could still kick your butt yeah, yeah. Well, um, and i, I think that, that was for it. yeah and the tricky thing is the answer isn't to say, well, we're not going to make women who are strong physically, right. because right. that Smart. can be a female attribute. But how do you do it and not be a cliche, maybe, is that? That's not true. Um, that Buffy always had an interesting relationship with her heroism. Like she was, mm -hmm. she was always a little reluctant. She, was, she, she, she knew that she could kick butt and take names. She, she 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 inhabited it, but there was always this little bit of reluctance. Like, oh, do I really have to do this? Do I really have to do? Do I have to occupy this space? And yeah, that, that's that's what I thought was the most interesting about that series is that we got our absolute kick-ass female character, but she had that. She still wore heels, and she was trying. Do I belong here? That's interesting because men resist the in the mm -hmm. traditional arc. Is resisting the call, but 
I don't think that goes on for as long as it does. No, so it's, it's, once they accept it, it's 100%. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, they they buy into it and they're, oh, I'm the hero now. There's, yeah, there's not a lot of second guessing themselves or, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Imposter, Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. definitely fits yeah. the Campbell thing. But Hermione is just more, seems like more of a, seems like a real woman hero to me because she's just really smart and she also is really brave and knows how to use a lot of things but she's I don't know I mean I, there, there's so many we don't have to and look because she's all. doing a lot of work and the guys are taking the credit right <laughs> yeah well, obviously that second one I went home very disappointed but I thought later they I mean I always thought why would J.K. Rowling write a story about another chosen boy why would a woman do that to us and then I realized oh because she has a son of course, then it. Well, Le Guin, oh. uh, Wizard of Earth C, mm -hmm. it took her years to realize that she had fallen into that. But it's, I think it's one of the limitations of the heroine's journey, of the hero's journey in general, is that it asks us to conform to these expectations and to these tropes and to these structures. Um, and it's, I think, something that is a problem for both women's stories and men's stories that we say you fall into these positions depending on which one you are and you don't really get a choice. Um, it is expected and we play to those expectations. Um, it's obviously more keen to me on the woman's side because that is my own experience, but um, it, it, there's also a certain point I think at which the hero's journey as a structure starts to box us in. Mm -hmm. Well, and then too, um, so often mm -hmm. with the emotional journey that mm -hmm. that is gone through whether it's a, a male or female hero is the men tend to the focus tends to be more on the physicality you know the injuries they take are they going to be strong enough are they going to be doing this where a lot of times the women's that emotional journey is about the consequences you know if I do this thing what are the consequences going to be? You know, am I um, am I giving up my place in society? Am I, you know, am I going to be able to do the traditional female things now that I've done this? I think uh, Mulan, mm -hmm. the actual Mulan, um, was not killed for dressing as a man and you know going into war, but she had the rest of her life she had to basically be a man. You know, in the reality of it, she did not ever marry. You know, she was she had to take on that masculine aspect because that was the way the, the only way the society could accept her, that a female did these things. Oh, they essentially didn't what take their. Oh, the man was know what happened to Mulan. Mm. What well, I read about it was that the, there's a lot of stories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's a, there's a, a like core a, canon <clears throat> story that they think is the closest, but it's still folklore <clears throat> in many. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I was going to say, another way you can just compare and contrast the hero versus the heroine is like the Star Wars. You've got Luke Skywalker and you've got Rey. And you don't necessarily see it so much in the movies themselves because everybody in the movies is like, oh, hey, cool. She can do this stuff. But if you look outside of the movies to some of the fandom, there's a lot of people, well, how can Rey do all this? Well, I mean, and oh, you just look, mm -hmm. compare Rey and Luke, and you're like, they're doing almost the exact same thing, but Ray has more to prove than Luke ever did. And also, and this is, okay, this is, I'm gonna go off on a minor pet peeve rant. Luke is a uh, moisture farmer's son, um, has never really done anything with combat. A little combat he has done has been with a blaster. He gets handed a lightsaber as an immediately working bladed combat skills. <laughs> and everyone accepts this. Ray has been using a quarter staff, staff weapon her entire life, has familiarity like in close quarters combat, she is handed a lightsaber. The fight choreography actually does a reasonably good job of showing a in-situation acclimation from a long-bladed weapon to a short-bladed weapon, and then she's doing okay, and everyone goes, that's unrealistic. How would she know how to hold a lightsaber? She just picked it up, and it's like, she actually has more qualifications than Luke ever did. Right? Yeah. Like, and, you know, how could she be so tough and strong? She was a freaking scavenger living her on our own. Of right. course she's tough and strong, because otherwise she'd be dead. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Say, There's my rant. Talk about like the piloting, and it's like if you ever if you read any of like the lead up or anything around the sequel trilogy, she found a flight flight simulator. That's how she knew how to fly anything. And it's like 
but you have to sit here and say, here are the reasons why she could do this. And then there's still people out there who are like, nah, that makes no sense. She's Mary Sue. Yeah. 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 And that's just, I'm sorry, that's one of my... She did the work. No, I'm right there with you. And who's just been experience. shooting you know, monk rats? Just, yeah, like, right? Yeah. Yeah. Eyes all over a compliment. Oh, she's a girl. She's a Mary Sue. No. If you want to marry... I'm sorry, Luke. Luke just... I like Luke. Don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. But Luke went and everyone's like, oh, cool, yeah, no, I can completely accept that. Ray comes up, uh-uh, nope, she can't do that. Yeah. And it just no. gets me yeah. It's <laughs> and, and then the question becomes is when you, if you are looking to write something, make something, create a story of some kind, these are the tensions that we have to address. Because on the one hand, you can say, I'm going to make a character and I'm going to give entirely, utterly rational backgrounds. I'm going to spend all this time and energy justifying why my female character can do and be the things that she is. Or you can write a male character and not have to do any of that. <laughs> and you can start to see why J.K. Rowling writes, you know, a little boy Harry Potter. I'm, a, I'm going to disagree. Okay. I read all seven books from the perspective of she was the power behind the throne, she ran everything, she succeeded. Harry was a puppet. And I mean, that's the way it came across to me. So when I read it to my kids, I read all seven books to my kids. I'm sorry, what did I just say? Hermione, Jesus. I actually, I used to call her Hermione. Yeah. But, but the question becomes, and, and that's a, a fantastic way to read it to your kids, but the question becomes, why can't we just call the book Hermione Granger? Why do we then have to put the boy's name on the front? Because if we know that most people aren't going to read it that way. Well, it's going to be a two book series. Um, I have when I yeah, recommend to, like, to parents. Oh, that has a that has a, a female protagonist. My kid won't read that. Bull. Those boys will will read those books and love them. It's the parents that put that limit on uh, oh, that gender long. constraint. <laughs> so I'm assuming, at least of all the ladies in the room, we've all read a lot of books with male protagonists mm -hmm. that we like and enjoy and treasure and cherish. A really common thing is that we are asked to read stories with people who don't look like us, and we that is what we get. We are okay with it. We learn to treasure and cherish those identities, but we don't ask young boys to do the same. The, either as parents, as teachers, as family members, as siblings. The expectation is, is you're always going to be you can find books that look like you and you can be handed a book and you can say, ew, it's a girl's book, and you don't read it. I don't ever get to say, ew, it's a boy's book. It's a book. Right. So how do we start changing that? When I had an kids? adventure book out, all of a sudden, you know, when I had a horse book out, everyone assumed no, it was it's a girl's girl book. Right. But when I had an adventure book, parents would walk up and what they would ask me is, you know, is it for boys? I'm like, well, it's not a romance. If that's what you're asking, although boys can read romance. <laughs> Too, you know, but what they really wanted to know was, does it have a male main character? And I kind of run into a void answering that question because it's like it's an adventure story. Well, I think some of it does go back, like like this gentleman said about how he read the Harry Potter books to his kids. Because when I was a girl, now you know I'm in my fifties. I wanted to read the Hardy Boys. I didn't want to read Nancy Drew. I hated Nancy Drew. I thought, oh God, she only cares about her clothes and her hair. And I wanted to read the Hardy Boys. I was allowed to read them. But when it was time to go to the store and buy a book, our parents would buy her Nancy Drew. She's my sister. Mm -hmm. She could read Nancy Drew, and I wanted them to buy me the Hardy Boys. Oh, no, no, those are for boys. We can't, you have to pick something else. Yeah. And that's a generational thing, obviously. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, as, you know, I don't have children myself, but as we grow older, you know, we can change that. So it yes. is up to the parents and how they do that. Makes, because I have difference. heard I have heard that and you said it's not true, it's the parents. You said you said that, Jill. Um those boys won't read a, a story about a, with a girl heroine, but girls will read books with the male hero. And you know, I don't know how true that is. I'm not in sales or marketing. marketing. You know, that. So, so a really, a really interesting. I don't know. Can I, can I jump in with one thing that I want to point out, just to all the guys, is that it is, although you might not see it, easier for a guy to say, "Oh, well, I read past that," or it's not really a woman being put into the background, or it doesn't really get into the way of a story, and it does hit differently when it's the character who you're identifying with, who's the one being pushed into the background. Easier to reach in 
Then and it's it easier to say yeah. that's no big deal. Yeah. Got it. If you're I think the, the question question gentleman has said, he's had his hand up for a while in the back. Aspect of the keep pointing to J.K. Rowling. Considering the number of times she was rejected, if she made Hermione the hero, she would have made it into print. Yeah. Probably not. Absolutely. That's absolutely entirely likely. It probably wouldn't have might not have been a bestseller. Yeah, sold. Well, I think it would have been as good a seller if it had made it into print, but would the yeah. Would, the, know, would the gatekeepers would the have published have it? Ever printed it? I would be curious to know for you guys who have published in the um, fantasy sphere, something I get told often from my friends in the publishing industry is that female writers and female um, heroines often get marketed as YA um, when male stories that are written for a YA level often get marketed as full science fiction fantasy. Is that something that you guys can speak to? Jenny probably better on the YA, but as far as grown-up stuff, if you have a female hero, until about 10, 15 years ago, literary fiction or romance. Or romance. Mm. It was a lot of women used initials or mm -hmm. male pseudonyms because I'm not going to buy a fantasy novel written by a woman. What does she know? You know, that, there was that horrible attitude of uh, the same with the kind of the hard-boiled mystery series. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult up until about 10, 15 years ago for a woman to build up that name, you know, and, and to even be accepted. Well, I think there is truth to that. I think what happens a while ago when YA sort of became a boom genre for a while, all of a sudden all these people were going, what about the boys? What are they going to read? Now, in the meantime, picture books, people have looked at picture books in middle grade, and those both have more male protagonists. And then you go, you know, if you're a teen boy, you're reading adult science fiction and fantasy to find those characters. So I think it is true, but in a, not in a, it's almost like it's the one genre where being female is a little bit less of a liability. Although even there, some of the guy, people who get the biggest marketing it still does, there's still biases, even within YA. Could I ask a quick poll of the audience? First, <laughs> if you are a female, do you have a favorite book or series with a fa with a male lead? Like, as yeah. like Raise your my hand. favorite? Not author? necessarily your favorite, 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 but you know, something that would be a, yes, I would, you know, I would read that does it count as a totally female and a male? Because <laughs> <laughs> if not, then no. <laughs> well, yeah. Does it count if they're rabbits? Because the green went to water should down. Unless it's <laughs> But, okay. The books that female people. Do you, you have at least one book that you would consider one of your favorites that has a male lead? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Males in the audience. Do you have at least one book? that you would consider one of your favorites that has a female lead. One of your all-time favorites. You are also in this panel, so right. select your <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think, did any women not raise their hands? Did any men not raise their hands? We're willing to admit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This... There's progress. Uh, yeah, slowly. Good progress. I have another question about the hero's journey that I want to ask. Yeah. Oh, it is, it is, what happens if you're not binary? Yeah. So what does that do to that journey? And I'm not qualified to answer that, being comfortably binary. But It runs very hard, wanna... I think, into the question of a lot of the tropes used for male and female characters, and particularly for female characters, is the fertility trope. Is if I need to give my female character a crisis and then think about reproduction. Um, as I say, with a shirt I'm wearing, um, the Black Widow 
Um, they went and took that movie and they started off giving her a really particularly interesting sort of romance that wasn't a romance, and then they went and made it all about babies. Ugh. Yeah. <sighs> Why? It's so lazy. So I think that question, when you start to be blurring those lines like that, starts to run into the tropes that we use to assign conflict and emotion start to get tricky. Our society isn't built for that. Well, and you know, if you have a Disney or movie or a Pixar movie and you need built-in early strike, you kill them all. Yeah. 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 Not the dad. Not the dad. Well, they did once. They did. Yeah. A lot of the dad. Abominable. But that was a Hamlet, like. Yeah. Times of the stories, the dad's not even present. The dad, like, died a long time ago, or the dad wandered off and never returned, and it's always very focused on the relationship between the main character and his mother, or, you know, the girl that he liked in town, or something like that. Well, well, the children's she, stories, they seem to all be orphans. I don't know. It's yeah. not my well, impression. Is. Although, but I do have a question, too. Yeah. Okay. I was wondering if each of you could name one of your favorite heroines that you've written and what their journey was like. Maybe think about whether it relates to this. Abby Young. I have a young adult that's I've never, it was sort of the book I taught myself how to write with. So we'll probably never see daylight and probably never should see daylight. <laughs> but I was a young adult, high school student, and I had a character show up who was a cheerleader. And she was supposed to be just a drop, you know, a drop in character. She wasn't supposed to be anything. And she showed up and she wouldn't go away. And it turns out she had cheerleader magic. And I, I love that character to this day. One of these days, that character will probably show up somewhere with her cheerleader magic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think for me, um, Kim Harrison's her her witch series, so Rachel the Witch. Um, she doesn't really because it's urban fantasy. She tends to to be a fairly static character, but she has so she doesn't really go through the hero's journey. Um, but she doesn't go through the typical like female heroine tropes where you know she's abused or assaulted in some manner and that's what spurs her on to do the thing you know she's she's a rough and tumble pi she's you know she's already seen it all she hasn't been you know she hasn't been raped or anything like that but you know she's so she's which is nice i like the fact that she's she's gritty without having that assault background um, and she does grow a, across the course of what, 15 16 books or something but it's a long long arc um, and I just, I like her because she's fun, but she's pragmatic. She's sarcastic as hell. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't really care. She, you know, she's had a few relationships, but they're not, she ends up being the one to save most of the men in her relationship versus, you know, be, versus being the one who has to be saved, um, which is nice too. So I think she's one of my more, my favorite progressive female characters. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna change it two one for like young adult children's and then one for adult. Um, young adult children's is probably um, oh I can't pick one but any of the Tamora Pierce ones probably Kelly of Mindelin would be my selection for that one because that is uh, rather than the Alana series I have to hide and pretend to be a boy and so we're. I'm taken seriously she goes into the story being a girl and being unapologetic about it um, and I like that when the adult side um, Mercedes Lackey um, she wrote a book called by the sword about a woman by the name of Carolyn um, who does not have the assault rape background um, she chooses to be a fighter she chooses to be strong she chooses to be a mercenary um, but also in that chooses to be an equal partner, chooses to have a relationship, chooses to experience romance on her terms and walk away from it, um, and isn't isn't described by either being a woman in a man's world who is like a man or being, you know, a, a feminine woman who's all about the romance and relationship, but walks the line between both as an equal. For me, it'd have to be probably Meg Murray from a wrinkle in time from way, way back. Way back. 
because of the way that, you know, she doesn't fit in, but she's exactly what we need to save the world. Scout oh, and I reread it. You know, there's a lot of people worrying about her because she's a girl who needs protecting, and I didn't see that as a kid. When you read it as an adult, it's interesting. It's particularly interesting because she never pays any mind to it. <laughs> That's true. There's people, that is people around point. who are looking to protect her and looking to nurture her, and her character and her character's worldview in that does not notice, blows right past it. <laughs> she has a thing I didn't to do. notice. And I, I think that might be is that when you read it as a kid, you her. And yeah. you're like, well, I don't, I have a, come on. <laughs> Adults don't know what to do, I gotta do the thing. <laughs> Something that's nice about Mary Murray is that Madeline uh, Lingle continued to write uh, many, many books. But there was a book called Arms of the Starfish. Meg has grown up. She married to Calvin. I think that's right. And and they're both scientists, equal. And you get a sense of them being equal. They're they're secondary characters to the young adults who the stories about. But you have a sense that she continued on to being true to herself. She 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 achieved her potential. And it, and you never had the sense that like, well she just she she, she backed off, got married, and had babies. You've got my answer, you to be a scientist. Yep. And also the question earlier of what happens if you not get a binary gender. Uh, there are stories uh, on the describes of people being uh, closer to the gods or something like that, or being other in their foreign sites. But this other is a uh, way of saying not entirely human. If you look to the uh, Rim era, uh, very real to Native people with physical and mental disabilities, and those people were being killed. Uh, it is a way of saying humanity is not just what we are, it is what we are not. We are the other, we are not like them, they are not like us. Joseph Campbell referred to this as uh, the sort of thing that gives aliens to say, This is what humanity is, this is what the experience of being human is. But can you really imagine him uh, trying to distinguish between male and female journey beyond just, well, obviously there's male of humanity and male of men, and women have their place in the male of men? Probably the place where you see it currently um, is in manga and anime. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of gender bending, a lot yes. of. Um, is it twin tails, I think, where the the you know young male hero transforms into a magical girl, <laughs> you know, with, with the, the dual ponytails that are so common, and it is hysterical. Fan fiction is another mm -hmm. where, 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 Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I read a book not too long ago called Princess Holy Aura, which was about a like thirty year old guy becoming a teenage girl to save the world. <laughs> yeah. There's a cartoon that's like she wow I think she wow the she wow something like that where you know the 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 descendant of the you know the famous superheroine is the one that accidentally opens the box and so when he is the the she wow character he's female you know and the pink gives him strength you know and, and the way to, to destroy him is to mess his hair up and it's just it's so funny to see this. You know, teenage boy trying to deal with this ultra feminine power. <laughs> there have been interesting. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin's <laughs> Left Hand of Darkness, um, if you're familiar with it, is a particularly interesting science fiction story for a lot of reasons. One of which is because it attempts to, s it, it takes a, a Terran male human and puts him into a non Earth society that is a gender. Um, gender is, it functions differently. Um, than we are used to and sits down and looks at what does that mean for the society? What does that mean for the relationships within society? And what does that mean for a person coming from the outside in to interact with that society? Um, and it's it's hard because gender is something that is pretty deeply encoded into our social structures um, in, in all the ways that it got there and continues to be here. And so writing tends to fall back on that shorthand, it's it's very hard for a lot of people to get into a story that doesn't use those tropes because they literally do not have experience thinking of it any other way. Um, and it it's ever going to have to be a slow process of people of, uh, over time starting to get accustomed to these ideas. If you just drop them in at the, at, at the very end, it's 
people are going to say, I have no idea what that's happening. Well, those it's it's difficult to write a non binary I mean, I've got a non non binary character in my the third book in my series, and it's hard not to fall back on those binary pronouns and or because this this character is not human to default to words like it which tend to I don't want to dehumanize it I don't want to make this character lesser so that struggle to find the right words that are not the default but that are also going to still convey the right things to the reader and not completely confuse things it's it's a struggle. It's it's a good one. I think it's one that most writers should try. But it's it's hard to get out of that binary mindset. Yeah, a lot of reasons. I wish English had a set of pronouns that did not imply either a specific gender or that the pronoun was referring to something non non intelligent. And I mean, there's so many times when you want to have like a figure in the alley and you do not want to specify whether it's a male figure or a female figure or, you know. Historically, I think actually they was used for that until like the mid 1800s when there be began a linguistic shift away from that. Um, but I have seen some pretty s strong arguments saying that that is a, a possible option to return to because it had been used like that or, you know, new ones. And if I was going to say, I've been noticing, like, if you're dealing with non-binary characters, or, like, if you have non-binary people that you know, I've noticed that there's been a definite trend towards the singular they, mm -hmm. and I know that some people are having a really hard time separating they from the singular from they being a plural, but I've noticed that that's been a decided trend in some of the stuff that I've been reading. It's interesting because other languages don't necessarily have those hard boundaries. So I grew up speaking English and Spanish together, and the kind of they-ish term in Spanish doesn't necessarily have the same hard pluralistic. Actually, um, it's more ellos. It's all male. Uh, well, so there's, 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 my mm -hmm. there's that, but when you make the switch into they, there's not at least the pluralism um, constraint. So I found it easier to make the they as a singular non-binary Switch once you drop the all Mandarin issue that one Spanish word. has. Mandarin yeah. has a single uh, word for he, she, it, uh, for he, she, she, and animals and What's different characters. Although that was a late edition. I think Finnish. Finnish that has um, a sing one pronoun. But they don't care. Huh. The male, you know, female, I was, whatever. And I think it, I want to say it's ha. In Chinese, has ta. Ta. The ta. Yeah. But you know, I always thought with humans, we should have, I like to use human to avoid that man. But really, it should be man for all of us. And then woman, a woman is someone with a womb, so I think we should have P-men. <laughs> well, there's one to be a man, but we have to define what we're going to do. There are, there, are, there are other things to consider in that context. But. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, not a, it's not a simple thing, and I think I don't think anyone proposes to have an easy answer. Um, I have a slightly off-topic question from the, when I came in, you were talking about how there's so many stories that are a woman in a man's world. I'm just curious if there's any stories that are a male character who has to deal with people telling him, you can't do that, you're a man. Melanie Ron man. did a series, but she never finished it. I, I Michelle yeah. West, the Hunter books. Yes. Early on, do that. The men, although they're not told to be domestic, but the men do this mystical hunt, and they're kind of they work with their wolves for it, and that's so the women do all the politics because men, you know, they're too kind of coarse and, you know, they're about strength and you know politics is women's work. Mm -hmm. There've been a couple of offshoots on the Wonder Woman comics that go back to Amazonia and make it less of like BDSM light comics, um, which is a really good shift if you ask me. Um, but uh, there, there's a couple in that man. I can't think of any others, though, for the graphic novel world. I've got a few. Oh, isn't there one called Last years. Man Why or something? Yeah. Yes. Why the Last Man? Yeah. Or yeah. something that's it's, it's a world with no men. But it's not really a male character. Um, being told he can't be whatever or do whatever. He's the last man left on earth after a plague wipes out all men. 
Uh, and somehow he survived, and that's the course of the so series. He's, he's still he's, the special chosen with male protection. Yeah. 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 yeah he's, he's the last man on earth. He's, he's <laughs> literally the chosen one. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think his monkey might be. Wait, male. Is, he is doesn't his, have monkeys. So, is yeah. his mission to repopulate the earth? <laughs> no. no. Oh, oh. Really? <laughs> no, no, it's it's not. I mean, I could give you a spoiler and and, and tell people what it is, but. Um, it's not that, at least. There is but, one thing we do do with male characters, which is there's the trope of the incompetent man, you know, mm. oh no, yeah. mom is at a meeting tonight and I'm going to, or is working late, I'm going to have to cook dinner and do laundry. Wow. And even though I am a hero and smart and all of this, I am apparently stupid the moment I have to do, you know, work. oil and egg. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then usually he gets boosted up as being awesome anyway. But I well, haven't read it, but my thing. husband told me about a book called Glory Season. Oh, yeah, yes. I read that. So uh, yeah. yeah, the one thing I remember he says, yeah, and then this man went down and they like tried to give him a side saddle because they thought he couldn't ride a horse. That's actually a really in another interesting sci-fi exploration of gender and identity and humanity, humanage. Mm -hmm. uh, this glory season by David Brin. Mm -hmm. um, they actually have a copy of it downstairs in the little books mm -hmm. section. Yeah. Uh, do you? I. Do, if anyone doesn't know it, the, the basic concept of the world is that um, the women can reproduce parthenogenically, mm -hmm. so and they are kind of the, the dominant group in society, and they need men to <clears throat> trigger the parthenogenesis, and they can also reproduce the old-fashioned way, but um, <laughs> women kind of run the entire society and men are mostly on ships doing man stuff. Yeah. There's a great episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine where they they have to negotiate with a uh, civilization that is very female oriented and of course their their captain, Ben Sisko, is a male and they, they're like, no, we can't talk to you. They want to go to the next in command and they're like, they're so emotional and angry. How am I going to let them do this stuff? <laughs> we have two minutes, so we should probably head out to the last question. Okay, you have. Yeah, go yeah. for it. Um, speaking of Ursula Le Guin and some of the older ones, um, she did a short story called The Matter of Sergi, which dealt with uh, wolves. If you haven't read that one, it's really, really profound where women were decided to be separate and they would send the men off to these camps as young boys and then they would have their wars and. Uh, so they were broken away from the mothers, and the mothers were all lesbians. It, you know, it, she's it was really advanced. And with Maleficent, mm -hmm. I think that's a really good um, hero story, anti-hero story, too, that's more common right now. That's a great book. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition and Scion Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening. You never know what you're going to find in Tuscon. No.